ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control audio series, ECDC On Air. I'm your host, Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. On today's episode, we speak with Erica Duffel, Principal Expert in Hepatitis, and we discuss the ongoing hepatitis outbreak of unknown etiology in children. Erica explains what hepatitis is, what's unusual about the current outbreak, and what signs parents should look out for. We're joined today by Erica Duffel, Principal Expert in Hepatitis here at ECDC. Uh, Welcome, Erica. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Before we get into uh, your role here at ECDC, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to ECDC? So I'm a medical doctor by training. I specialised in public health in the UK, where we have a formal training programme that lasts five years. And during that training program, I subspecialized in communicable disease control. I then worked for several years uh, in the northwest of England as a consultant in communicable disease control, covering a sort of fairly large population of a few million. And this is a very busy job. And uh, much of my time was uh, taken up um, responding to outbreaks in the hospital and community, sort of everything from salmonella to tuberculosis. And it's during this job that I became interested in hepatitis. So I took on a lead role um, to develop and roll out a local strategy around hepatitis. Um, For me, it covers everything I feel strongly about in the work that I do. So it's about addressing inequalities, tackling the uh, needs of um, vulnerable populations, because many of the people who are affected by hepatitis come from uh, marginalized communities, such as people who inject drugs people in prison, migrant populations, and working collaboratively across different organisations. And from an epidemiological viewpoint, sort of hepatitis is quite challenging because it's quite difficult uh, data. So um, it's quite a nice challenge, uh, interesting to dig into. After I'd been sort of in the job for a few years, I managed to persuade my husband, while the children were still very little, to, uh, to travel overseas and had been actually looking to work in Asia or Africa, but I stumbled across the job advert at ECDC for an expert to to roll out the European surveillance system uh, for hepatitis. And here I am 11 years later. Perfect. Okay. So could you tell us a little bit about what your day-to-day work here at ECDC is like? What is generally involved? So um, my work is quite varied. Um, So together with other colleagues at ECDC and the team who work on hepatitis, we have a number of projects uh, where we work to support countries in the surveillance, prevention and control of hepatitis. And our work is mostly focused around hepatitis B and C. And our our work, um, the main sort of focus of our work has been supporting countries to develop better information for action. So they have the information that they need to understand their epidemics Um, and what is needed to effectively prevent and control uh, these infections. So many of our projects to date have been based around data, so getting better estimates um, of prevalence, because routine notification data doesn't really give us a clear epidemiological picture. Modelling projects to piece these sort of different prevalence estimates together to get an overarching estimate, national estimate of burden, and we've been working on a, developing a sentinel system in clinical sites to give us uh, information along the continuum of care. And in the last few years, we've rolled out a monitoring system where we collect and collate uh, data at the regional level to support countries in monitoring progress towards the sustainable development goals. We provide technical support to countries as well, so through uh, country visits, but also through the production of sort of technical guidances And many of these have been focused around the key populations, so people who inject drugs, migrant populations, people in prison. And we've just started a really interesting project where we're working on the elimination of hepatitis C in the prison setting, which, and this is a really great project, which we're working on in collaboration with the um, European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction. 
So our work is very varied and this makes it interesting. And what's good is that we have an engaged hepatitis network across the region. And this enables us to understand what the priorities are for tackling hepatitis and how we can best support countries. And we also work closely with various partner organisations such as WHO, European Drug Agency, clinical organisations such as the Liver Organisation, EASL. And this is really important as the hepatitis community is quite small. So it's really important that we work synergistically and collectively together to tackle hepatitis. You talked a little bit about the different kinds of hepatitis there. Could you tell us actually a little bit just about what hepatitis is uh, and how people get it? Yeah, so the the liver is actually one of your key organs. It's the largest solid organ in your body and it has many different functions. So it works to remove toxins from your blood. It's involved in metabolism. It's also involved in blood clotting and it has many other functions. And hepatitis is when you have an inflammation of the liver. And when this happens, it can affect many of these different functions. And people with hepatitis, they can present with sort of very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. But hepatitis can be more severe and it can lead to liver failure. And in rare cases, it can actually be fatal. And when we think of hepatitis, we often think of the viral hepatitis, A to E, as causing hepatitis. But there are many different infections and and non-infectious causes that can cause uh, hepatitis too. So basically, anything that can cause inflammation or damage to the liver. So other causes of hepatitis include sort of alcohol, um, certain medications, environmental factors such as um, pesticides, um, as well as sort of uh, different metabolic and autoimmune conditions and other viral and uh, non-viral infectious causes as well. In terms of how people can get it, it obviously depends on um, what the cause is. But if we think about hepatitis A to E, these viruses are really very different in terms of how they uh, are transmitted. So hepatitis A um, is transmitted through contaminated food and water um, from person to person through fecal oral transmission, particularly sort of in the household setting. Um, Hepatitis B is transmitted from person to person through sex or um, blood to blood contact. But many of those with chronic hepatitis uh, B um, are actually infected at birth um, from their mother um, or early in, early in life. And for hepatitis C, most of the infections that we see in the European region are acquired through unsafe uh, injecting drug use. Hepatitis D is a bit of a hitchhiker uh, virus that really only affects people who've also um, uh, got hepatitis B. And hepatitis E is like hepatitis A. It's spread through contaminated food uh, and water. Uh, So hepatitis has been in the news quite a lot recently due to a large number of cases affecting young children. How common is this type of event or outbreak? Hmm. So since the start of uh, April, there has been a lot in the news around these cases of hepatitis. We were aware from the start of April of uh, cases reported from Scotland where they saw an increase in cases in young children, predominantly under five, of severe acute hepatitis of an unknown etiology. So these are cases for whom hepatitis, viral hepatitis A to E had been excluded. These cases were um, previously healthy children. Following this alert, there's been a steady increase in the number of cases, similar cases reported from around the world. And the latest estimate from WHO is that there's around 650 probable cases reported from 33 countries, with a third of these cases reported from uh, the UK. 33 of these children have required liver transplants and there's been nine associated deaths. In the European Union, in European economic area countries, the latest data that we have are that there are 146 cases in children aged under 16 that have been reported from 13 countries, with most of these countries reporting just a few cases. And in terms of how common this event is, hepatitis of unknown origin is a rare cause of hospital admission. Um, These cases do occur from time to time. And we know from a study that was conducted in the UK that around a third of cases of what was considered to be infectious hepatitis never had an etiological agent identified. But there hasn't been any previous systematic surveillance around this. 
So we don't know how many cases we would normally expect to see in a country each year. And we don't know whether the cases that we see are different from these mystery cases that do crop up from time to time, or if this is something different. So we're working with countries to uh, explore this. So to come back to your question as to how common this type of event is, we haven't seen a similar situation to this previously, where we have a number of countries that have reported an exceedance in the number of cases of hepatitis of unknown etiology. This hasn't happened before. So this is an incident that obviously we're taking seriously and uh, looking into to, to try and understand what's going on. But what's important to emphasise is that even if some countries are reporting an increased number of cases compared to the baseline, that this remains a very rare event. What is ECDC's role in terms of covering this outbreak and European health? So ECDC has a really critical role in an incident like this in providing support to countries in their investigations, in reviewing the evidence and in assessing the risk to population health. And in this particular incident, we've had a number of countries that have reported cases with just a handful of cases. So what's been really important is our work in collecting and collating the data from across countries, piecing this information together, working collaboratively with the countries, not just in the European region, but globally, to try and understand what's going on so that we can investigate this incident to determine what lies behind it and to put in place any control measures that are needed. We've supported countries with providing uh, technical guidance to them around how they should be testing these cases. And we're working now with countries and with research groups and clinical groups to determine what, what needs to be done now in terms of the epidemiological investigations. So what studies need to be done to test some of the hypotheses in terms of what might be lying behind these cases and a further key role of an ECDC in an incident like this is around communications, ensuring that we put out clear messaging, highlighting what is known and what is unknown about the event. And we do this through many different routes of communication to ensure that the information reaches the public and public health and the clinical community in an effective way. How concerning is it that these cases are spreading with no obvious route of transmission? So there are many unknowns with this incident, and this is of concern. We don't know the agent that uh, the etiological agent that underlies these cases. We still don't have a clear understanding around transmission, whether the, uh, the evidence around whether there is human to human transmission remains unclear. What we do see from the data is that most of the cases appear to be sporadic, but it is possible that we don't see the full picture because we're only seeing the severe cases. Whether or not there's an increase in the number of cases in countries is unclear at this point in time, whether this is above the baseline that we would normally expect, and whether the cases that have been reported reflect the intense case finding that's ongoing in countries, or whether there is actually a true increase. But what we see from the UK and a few other countries is clear signals that there has been an increase in the number of cases. And we are aware that a number of children have been severely affected, requiring liver transplantations, and there have been a number of deaths associated with this incident. So this is an incident of great concern to us. What are the current hypotheses as to why this has occurred? So the laboratory investigations of cases have excluded hepatitis A to E in all cases. These are the common causes of hepatitis that we see in the community, and these are the first infections that we think of when somebody presents with hepatitis. So the initial hypotheses by the incident team in the United Kingdom centred around infectious causes or possible toxic exposure. So detailed information was collected from cases around exposures to food, drink, medicine and other personal habits. And these failed to identify a uh, common exposure. So food and toxic causes were not considered likely. And in addition, the UK have conducted detailed toxicological investigations into their cases. And these investigations are ongoing, but to date, these investigations haven't highlighted any significant findings. So based on the clinical and the epidemiological evidence to date from the UK and from other countries, 
an infectious agent is considered most likely as the underlying cause for these cases. One of the most striking findings from the investigation to date is that adenovirus has been found in a large proportion of the cases tested. It's accounted for around three quarters of the cases in the United Kingdom. The data from other countries in the European region is incomplete, um, but many countries have reported that they've also found adenovirus infection in their cases. Typing information has also indicated that many of the cases in the UK were of uh, this type 41. This has also been reported from um, other countries as well, including the United States and some of the European countries. And what's also interesting is that the United Kingdom have reported previous uh, rise in a community adenovirus circulation as well. So adenovirus infection has become the leading hypothesis And whilst this is plausible as a possible causal agent, it should be noted that this virus doesn't usually cause such a severe clinical presentation in otherwise healthy children. So the current thinking is that there may be a cofactor, such as a co-infection or previous infection with SARS-CoV-2 or another infection, or an environmental factor that's triggering a more severe infection or immune-mediated liver damage, or that public health measures that were taken during the COVID-19 pandemic have resulted in a lack of exposure for these young children and increased susceptibility, or that what we're seeing is there's been a large wave of normal adenovirus infections across the community that have caused a, a very rare or unrecognised complication to present more frequently. Further hypotheses are that there may have been changes to the genetic makeup of the adenovirus and that this has led it to change and trigger liver inflammation more easily or that what we're seeing is related in some way to a post-infectious SARS-CoV-2 syndrome. But what's important to note is that the investigations are still ongoing. So the data on the testing of the cases for infectious and non-infectious causes are incomplete. And so different etiologies are still under investigation and haven't been excluded. And until we can exclude these different causes through more thorough investigation of the cases, through advanced epidemiological studies, we need to keep an open mind. Sorry, just to clarify, what is an adenovirus? So adenoviruses are common pathogens that usually cause self-limited infections, particularly in children. They spread from person to person and they most commonly cause uh, respiratory illnesses, such as the common cold, um, as well as gastroenteritis, conjunctivitis, and uh, occasionally cystitis. Adenovirus infections don't usually cause hepatitis in immunocompetent children, so healthy, previously healthy children. There have been cases reported in the literature where adenovirus infections have caused hepatitis in immunocompromised children, so it's children who have a impaired immune system, but it's not commonly associated with hepatitis in healthy children. How likely is it the number of cases will continue to increase? I think this is quite difficult to to predict. Um, Our epidemic curve, which shows the number of cases over time, uh, indicates a recent fall in the number of cases over the last few weeks. But what we know is that there's a reporting delay with these cases. So it's actually quite difficult to interpret this trend and draw any sort of firm conclusions. And having raised the alert of an ongoing situation, there's been a lot of case finding in countries. So it's very likely that more cases are going to be detected and reported um, before we can identify what's going on and put in place sort of control and prevention measures. And of course, we don't know what the etiological agent is. So if it is due to adenovirus infection, what we don't know is whether we will see further high levels of circulation of adenovirus in the community and that this, whether this will lead to uh, an increase in cases of hepatitis in children in the future. So how concerned should parents be and what should they look out for? What have been the symptoms that have been often reported? So the clinical picture of these cases has been of a severe uh, acute hepatitis with jaundice that's required hospitalisation in a large proportion of the cases. Many of the cases have had gastrointestinal symptoms in the week preceding the onset of jaundice with symptoms of 
vomiting, diarrhea, nausea. Some of the cases have also reported lethargy, with a smaller proportion of the cases reporting a fever and respiratory symptoms. Parents should be reassured that the number of cases that have been reported is really very, very low, and that severe acute liver failure in children is very rare. In most children who have vomiting or diarrhea or other gastrointestinal symptoms, these are usually self-limiting symptoms. A warning sign is if these symptoms persist or if the child develops jaundice. So this is when you would see a yellowing of the uh, conjunctiva or the whites of the eyes or the skin. And if they do see that, they should seek medical attention or if they're concerned in any way. And what we'd also advise parents is to take sort of normal hygiene measures such as hand washing that would help reduce the spread of many common infections. And we would also advise that any children who have diarrhea or vomiting stay at home and uh, they don't return to nursery or school until they're symptom free for at least 48 hours. Where can people go to find the most up-to-date information on this hepatitis outbreak? So we have a wealth of information on the ECDC website and we are trying to keep this as updated as we possibly can. We've also been working on a weekly surveillance bulletin together with WHO and this includes the latest data on the cases in the European region that have been reported to ECDC. And obviously people can go to their local public health website for information relating to their local situation. That's great. Thanks very much for your time today, Erica. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We hope you found this episode informative. You can find more information about the outbreak in ECDC's situation updates, which you can find links to in the notes of this episode. For more information about ECDC in general, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media for the latest news.